First off, uh, quickly, I want to announce the uh, the final. The final is going to be take home. Uh, it shouldn't be too long. It's going to be like you know, maybe anywhere from like two to four pages, double space, maybe three to four. Um, and uh, it's going to be very simple. It has to do with meeting people around you. So if you haven't met anyone yet, please do so. I, maybe after class or something like that. Um, and I'm going to be sending it out tonight, and it's going to be due. You're going to, it's going to be take home. It's going to be due a week from today. So instead of turning in your weekly homework, your weekly write up, you're going to be turning in the final before next Tuesday, which is the last class. Okay? Sound good? Perfect. Um, and. What your last name? <laughs> what well, I know, I didn't know. I didn't know. Okay. So, uh, so here we are. Very, very happy to have um, Stephen Webster. He is the CEO of Ascense, uh, a personal training company, which I'll have him explain a little bit more about. Uh, he also has held uh, senior director positions at big tech companies, including Adobe and Microsoft. So, if you have any questions about that, uh, and let's give a big round of applause, Stephen Webster. <laughs> How many people here play sport in my college? Any roars out of interest? Awesome. You and I talk better. Um, how many people think you learn more playing sport than you learn in lectures? Learn more about yourself? Me too. That's kind of some of what I'm going to talk about today. So the title of the talk is uh, Nana Karobe Yaoki. And for any Japanese speakers here, I apologize in advance for pronunciation and for probably some poor placeholder text as well. Um, fall seven times, get up eight. When Mackenzie asked me to come and speak, the topic was failure. Let's talk about failure and struggles. And I kind of have a problem with that. Uh, and it's not because I'm a high achiever, on the contrary. Uh, the problem I have with talking about failure is I feel like in the world of startups, and in the Bay Area and Silicon Valley in particular, we celebrate failure far too much. There's a mythology around startups. We, it's all, you know, I mean, we all love to listen to and to tell and to retell stories that fit certain archetypes. And one of the archetypes we all love, from Jason and the Argonauts to Star Wars, is the hero's quest or the hero's journey. This idea that somebody just has this call to adventure and they follow this calling and it's just challenge after challenge after temptation after challenge and somehow they win at the end and in that win they're transformed. They've transcended and we love our we love our, st our startup stories to fit that archetype as well. And that's not, um, you know, they're, they're exciting, but I don't feel they're particularly educational. How many of you here, and I'm guessing by the course, either it's an easy credit or you're actually genuinely interested, how many people here aspire at some point to perhaps work in a startup or even have a startup of their own? That would make sense. How many people have a startup already? Cool, it's an uh, interesting trend. So I want to share with you, uh, uh, you know, share with you some learnings along the way. But like I said, there's, there's this kind of mythology that you have to fail, you have to get beat up, and I'm a little bit concerned about this next slide, given the age of the class, whether this is going to be a total mess. But it's almost as if you're telling people, if you weren't going to be able to win a karate competition, if you want to win a tournament, something like this. First, you have to endure this. If you get beat up by the guy you're going to beat in the competition and all of his buddies, and being a startup founder is kind of like this, like pressed up against the, the face in pain. And it's, I mean, you know, I'm here to tell you, it's not really like that at all. So I know, it, it happens, I know a little bit about karate and about coaching martial arts, and I know a little bit about starting and building companies. And like my question at the beginning, I feel like each has informed the other for me throughout my life and throughout the companies that I've built. So I'm going to do something a little bit different today. I'm actually experimenting a presentation on you guys. But I want to talk about both. I want to talk about how the lessons I want to share um, from how I think about building products, how I think about building teams, and how I think about building companies. I learned on the field and I learned on the dojo, and you may have learned some of these lessons for yourself already. And I would encourage you to bring them uh, to your ambitions of startups. So my name's on the slide for you now. So, um, like I said, my name, or, or, as, as I was introduced, my name's Stephen Webster. I actually uh, studied at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland, and I studied there from 91 to 95. During that time, I competed and I captained the karate club. And then in 1998, the club was basically in decline. The club, so after I graduated, I was still helping out coaching there, but the club was basically about to fall. 
And then the university came along and said, would you, would you take over the club? Would you take over teaching the karate club? Kind of terrifying thing to be asked to do for a whole number of reasons. But I took over the club in 1998. I'll tell you about that as we go. In 2002, I started my first company, a software and design company. And I sold that company to Adobe in 2005. That's uh, pretty much the reason I ended up over here, as I moved over here with Adobe in 2009. So I built new companies inside of Adobe. I helped build Adobe Consulting Organization. I helped build a, a design and innovation group called TXI. You can ask me, that should be a good exam question for you, what the X stands for. Anyway, so I, I helped build this, uh, a couple of divisions inside of Adobe, and then Microsoft asked me to join, and I started a new organization for Microsoft in San Francisco. You would never have seen a Microsoft sign anywhere, anywhere. we called it Studio 415. It was kind of a startup innovation group inside of Microsoft set the market San Francisco. And then I left to do it all again. I left uh, just over three years ago, almost four years ago, to start this new company, Ascensi. And before, Ascensi kind of brings together everything I love about, I studied CS and EE, so everything I love about hardware, about software, about design, about building companies, about sport and sport coaching, kind of all smushies together for Ascensi. And so I'd love to spend a few minutes and just show you the, the, the company that we're building, um, and then talk about some of the lessons learned along the way. Sensei, your personal trainer who knows your every move. Keep your chin up and eyes to the horizon. Nice, that's good form. With sensors throughout your clothing, she tracks your posture and movement and gives you feedback on form and progress, all delivered in real time in your ear. Your handwork is improving. Now let's add a roundhouse. She is trained by experts to help you excel. Drive more with your legs. You will feel less strain on your arms. Much better. You got this. Engage your core and lengthen your spine. Nice. Now into Cobra. You've done this better. Pivot faster with your right foot. Good. Again. A sensei gives you access to the world's best coaching content. Your form and endurance are improving, but let's add TRX to strengthen your legs and core. She doesn't just count repetitions. She sees your form, corrects your mistakes, optimizes your practice. Adam is having trouble with this pose. If you're a trainer or instructor, a sensei is your assistant. She even monitors your students' progress when they train without you. The more you train, the better she gets to know you and how to coach you uniquely, unlocking your natural ability to make unprecedented gains. if not days, uh, but certainly more than days and weeks. And we're actually launching with rowing as our first form. So uh, uh, we should definitely have a conversation. Cal can row. Okay, so the first thing I want to talk to you about uh, is this concept here. Uh, the gentleman you see on screen is a, a, a gentleman by the name of uh, Hirozoku Kanazawa, or Kanazawa Sensei. And Kanazawa Sensei was one of the youngest people slated to be the All Japan National Karate Championship until two weeks before the championship when he broke his arm. Um, before the, the, the All Japan Nationals. 
And his mother actually said to him, uh, when you compete in karate, do you do it with one arm? And he said, no, I do it with my whole body. And she said, well, then you're entering the tournament. So his mom made him enter the All Japan uh, National Championships. And, uh, and he won. And he won basically with one arm tied behind his back. I mean, I know it's a little bit of a cliche, uh, but he won uh, literally by guarding his broken arm and using the other arm to parry and then score when it was time to score. And that story always kind of stuck with me. And I'll tell you when it resurfaced. So it's 1998. I've been asked by the University of Edinburgh, will you take over the karate club? And I loved the club. I'd, you know, I'd been in the club for a student as four years. I'd stayed on in the club as another three years. But we were in total decline. We'd stopped entering tournaments. And you guys know, most students, you know, you, you last at university for like maybe a four-year cycle. So after four years, most of the students in that class have never seen a karate tournament in their, in their life. Because uh, for reasons I won't bore you with, uh, the club had stopped going. And so when I took over the class, I took it over like literally weeks from the end of the, the academic year. And the, the academic year culminates with the national championships. And so I called the organizer and said, I know we don't have an entry. I know it's past the entry date, but we're coming. We, 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 we want to go. And we, we drove through to Glasgow on a bus for a fight, which is a pretty scary thing to do at the best of times, even if it's a cry competition. Um, but we, we drove through to Glasgow. And it was pretty humbling. It was pretty humiliating. We, we didn't do very well, as you would expect, from a club that had never been to a tournament before. But I told the team before we went, we're coming back. Uh, so we're going there to learn. We're going there to watch. We're going, to, we're going there to see what other people do. We're going there to see how this whole, this whole game is played. And I was there as a coach to figure out how are we going to come back and not get you. We actually we picked up a couple of medals, but nothing impressive. And when I got back on the bus, to drive back to Edinburgh, I told the team, we're coming back next year and we're going to win the tournament. And we did. And on the bus home uh, from Stirling uh, that year, uh, after winning it for the first time, I said, we're going to win three in a row. And we did. And the third year, feeling a little bit ballsy about this whole program at this point, <laughs> the third year is like, we're going to win ten in a row. And it was a promise I regretted making many times, especially so publicly. And in 2008, when I moved to California, I brought back the trophy with our name 10 times on it. We managed to win the national championships 10 years in a row. The club's now won it 18 times in the last 19 years. And the other eight, the people that coached that club were my beginners, my white belts. Some of them took that beating in Glasgow with us uh, the first day. And this, how we won our first tournament, it was this idea of, well, if that guy can win a competition with one technique, Kiyakazuki, a reverse punch, that's the only technique he won the competition with. That's how our entire club is going to win in every single category. And I'm going to relate this to startups in a second. And what I did with the club for a whole year, any time we were practicing tournament karate, I only let people throw that one punch. Sounds kind of boring, right? But what we didn't do was try and learn lots of kicks and lots of sweeps and lots of throws and lots of different punches and lots of combinations. It was one punch, but we made sure we were doing everything about that punch correctly. Our distance, our timing, our confidence, our angles. Like we really worked on everything that supported us so that when the moment came and there was an opening, we knew how to score a point and the next point and the next point. And we won medals in every category. When you got to the finals, it was two of my fighters competing for bronze, two for competing for silver and gold. We were, we were in all of the places. And that, I've told that story so many times to companies that have started, to teams that have started, and how it relates. And it really, if I back up a little bit, I maybe didn't set this up as well as I could have done. What I want to share with you today isn't things I've learned failing, it's the things I do to make sure I don't fail. Okay? If I'm teaching you karate, I'm not going to teach you how to take a punch. I'm going to teach you how not to get hit. You know, okay, so, so that's what I want to share with you. And the, the thing I want you taking away from this is if you're starting a company, it's critically important you think about what's the one thing we're going to do really well. Now, there's a book you might have heard of. If you, if you care about tech startups, you'll read this book at some point. It's called Crossing the Chasm by a gentleman called Jeffrey Moore. And I've been very lucky to get to know Jeff. I mean, he's a legend in the valley at this point. Um, but he always has this saying, I've heard him say to me and to others many, many times, if it's two, it's none. What market are you going to focus on? We're going to focus on rowing and weightlifting. If it's two, it's none. Pick one. And so I, you know, I really encourage, you know, when you're thinking about a startup, what's that one feature? What's that one market? 
uh, that you're going to enter and just be ruthless about doing that. And in the early days of Ascensi, when I was out trying to raise funding um, with nothing but a slide deck and idea and a semblance of a track record, and I was asked by investors, what sports, you know, are you going to, oh, oh. you know, if posture and form and movement are important, like those are the sports we're going to be able to coach. And it wasn't until we actually, through a methodical process, said, rowing. We're going to start with rowing. Like serendipity happened, like Olympic coaches, Olympic athletes start showing up on our doorstep. Everybody I've met as a rower, investors invest in us because their kid is rowing crew at <coughs> University of Washington. Sorry to mention University of Washington. But you know, their kid's rowing you know, crew at UW. And so just by picking that one thing and making sure we do it well, all the rest of the pieces fall into place. And if I have to teach myself a lesson time and time again, it's that one. Because the tendency of the entrepreneur is we feel like we have infinite capacity. We can do as much as we want. Pick one thing and do it well. One hit, one kill. My club have heard me use this phrase so many times. When ignorance is mutual, confidence is king. And when you look at these two women in this final, I mean, just look at them. They're just standing there looking at each other. And they just, you know, you wouldn't think for a moment there's any nerves. And when they start moving, they're just so composed, so relaxed. You can watch this video while I talk for the next five minutes and barely a technique will be thrown. There's just this composure and this confidence. And when I taught my club this idea of scoring with one punch, I spent a disproportionate amount of time teaching them how to just stand at that front before the referee starts the match. I taught them to always stare here. Don't try and look your opponent in the eyes, they'll freak you out. Just look there and make them think you're looking in the eyes. Swing your hips just gently from side to side, because really your legs are shaking with all that adrenaline. So don't show it, just kind of, uh, all of the things I could do to give them that sense of confidence, because there's something really about, something really interesting about confidence. When you start to assume it, you start to get it. It comes back to you. And something I really want to share, and it's, you know, I don't think there's enough of us starting companies that are vulnerable about this, but every single week, uh, my wife's sitting in the back here, she'll maybe even tell you every single day, I have a moment where, you know, and I measure my career in decades now, I've done okay, I've you know, sold a company, but there's not a week goes by where I'm like, am I high? Can I really do this? You know, what am I thinking? Is this, you know, and, and the doubt creeps in. And yeah, I'm very lucky that I have a group of other um, entrepreneurs and like senior leaders that I, I, I spend some time with on a leadership course each month. And we've all confessed this to each other. We all experience what is called imposter syndrome. We all, I, when, you, when you start a startup in the valley, just don't read, uh, this will be online, don't read TechCrunch, I'm just going to say it. Don't go and read what other founders are doing. You guys will be sitting in a coffee shop and somebody's starting a company and you say, how's it going? Oh, we're crushing it. Everyone's crushing it, but they're not. Like crushing what? You crush your presentation. Um, you know, and you read, everyone's raising money. Everyone but you is raising money, and it's not true. Okay, there's so many other companies out there who are just doing it. They're just doing what they do. They get up every day. What's the next thing? What's the one thing they're going to do well? And they, they focus on doing it. When I started my first company, um, a guy that worked for me helped me with my marketing, a guy called Ash Gupta. Um, great Scottish Indian guy. He's now in his 70s, and you would think he's 25. And I remember Ash saying to me, never sell Amagonas. I was like, no, Amagonas? What's an Amagonas? He's like, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. And like, never tell everyone all the things you're going to do. Just deliver. Um, so I, I really want to share that with you. Um, if you start a company, if you feel like an imposter, you feel like the rest of us. But when ignorance is mutual, confidence is king. Just have trust in your idea, have trust in your team, and focus on execution. Again, if any, of my, if any of my former teams are watching this video on YouTube, they're rolling their eyes at this slide. Here he goes again, critical non-essentials. This is an idea I stole from the, the, the England rugby team, and you've no idea how hard it is for a Scotsman to steal an idea from the England rugby team, uh, but I'll steal it nonetheless. So it's 2003, it's the Rugby World Championships, and England caused a huge upset in Australia, winning the World Championships, beating the Australian team in the final. And the coach, Sir Clive Woodward, hero of mine, one of the best business books you can go and buy is a book called Winning by Sir Clive Woodward. And it's a book about uh, the journey of the England rugby team all the way up to uh, the World Championships, fused with all of his lessons. He's an entrepreneur and uh, uh, you know, business owner as well. And I've stolen a ton of ideas from Sir Clive Woodward. But the idea of critical non-essentials is, 
what are all the little things that you can do that individually don't seem like they're going to make that much of a difference, but no one else is doing them, and all done together, you're always going to be better than the rest of the pack. So the England rugby team had a ton of them. It would be things like, you know, travel with your own pillows. I mean, if you travel a lot, you get to a hotel, you're like, oh, this bed sucks and this pillow. They traveled with their own pillows. They always, this is before everyone used hand sanitizer. They always used hand sanitizer. Why? One person in the team with a cold gets everyone unwell, which just brings your performance down by that marginal gain that matters between winning or losing at a national level. But I actually want to talk to you about this rugby shirt uh, that Jason's wearing up here. Now this is at a time where rugby shirts, and some of them still are, were big, thick, heavy, cotton, baggy uh, rugby shirts. I remember getting made to wear them at school, like horrible pieces of clothing. <coughs> and that's what everyone was wearing in 2003 on the world stage, and then England show up in this skin-tight lycra kind of muscle-showing uh, uniform, and the media were ripping on them, the other teams were ripping on them. As I look at the England ballet team that's just showed up to the, to the world championships, why do you think they were wearing? A skin-tight Nike rugby shirt. Critical non-essential. Because you can't grab onto a shirt that's skin-tight. Spot the rugby player in the room. Uh, <laughs> you can't grab onto a shirt tackling. It's harder. If that shirt is really tight, it's really hard to grab a hold of that shirt. So that was definitely uh, one of them. Uh, the other thing I'll share, just for, for, for experience, I'll share one more. There was little rubber nodules on the kind of the rib cage of the shirt. Little kind of like rubber grippies like you sometimes get on the bottom of socks. You're not allowed to answer. Uh, anyone else have an idea why those might have been there on the shirt? Scrum. Sorry? Scrum. For the scrum, what about it? They grip on the player in front of them. That's a great, I, I'm going to tell people that anyway. That's a great idea. <laughs> but no. Uh, anyone else? So Sir Clive Woodward had analyzed the game and the turnaround uh, of the ball to the other team so often happened because you're holding the ball and you're running and somebody bats it out or the ball gets slippy and the ball gets wet and it slips out. So those rubber nodules were just enough to grip that ball on the shirt. Critical non-essential. So the England rugby team worked with Nike on like nine or ten of these innovations on the shirt. Do you know what happened in the 2004 World Championships? Everyone was wearing shirts like this. And that's what happened in the, in the cry competitions as well. For two or three years, my club were throwing reverse punches when everyone else was trying to be flamboyant and score the high scoring techniques, the three points. And we were just winning a point at a time. Give it two or three years, every club was just throwing reverse punches. We moved on, but the state of the art had, had followed us. So critical non-essentials, this is an exercise I go through. I'm now talking to you about team building and how do you build a team that's not going to fail? How do you build a team that exhibits excellence? And uh, I really, what I do with my teams is I sit them down and we write these together. What are the things we're going to do together as a team that are the behaviors that no other team does? But if we do them and we hold each other accountable to them and we're consistent with them, we'll perform better. Um, I hope I remember to do this actually. Let's see if I can flip to my browser quickly. by 180 resolution. So critical non-essentials, what does this mean in my business? Sorry, the uh, screen resolutions. Uh. So I always get asked for a pitch deck. Send me your pitch deck. I don't send people a pitch deck. I send them a document. Because when people say I want your pitch deck, what they're actually saying is, before I even decide to give you a meeting, I want to read for myself about your business. And sending someone a deck is the worst possible document. Decks are for presenting. Decks are to support your story. Like if, if I gave somebody the slides I've been using today, how many of you could go and tell the stories that I've just told you? You don't remember that information is not on the slide. Information goes on a document. So critical non-essential for us as a team is we will not send out a deck until we've presented it, rule, but we will send out a document, and a thoughtful document, that it should take an investor around three to four minutes to read to decide whether they want to have a meeting with us or not. And so this is our pitch document. Another critical non-essential, um, we deliver it in this uh, technology platform called Docsend. Now, I don't work for or have any affiliation or any stake in Docsend, but I should do. Uh, Docsend allows me, anytime one of you wanted my deck, I'll just give you a, a unique URL. I'll see when you share it with other people. And I've learned that sharing 
Sharing is caring. Like the more someone shares that debt with other partners in the firm, with other venture partners in the firm, and the more quickly they do that, so the more quickly they read the document from the moment I send it, if they open it right away, I'm like, oh, okay, you're interested. Then it gets shared with a couple of venture partners. I'm like, okay. And then I go and look up those partners. Who is this that they're sharing the deck with? So critical, non-essential, and I'm beginning to learn the, the level of interest in the deck. But even better, I get page level analytics on how long they hover on each page. I do this all the time. I'll get a little notification, you know, Joe is reading your deck. And I can literally see these bars growing on each page as he's reading each page. But what this is telling me is I can see, you know, the blue bars are each page. So he's visited the deck twice. The blue bars are telling me how long he or she spent on the page. And I can see that the interest is over here. I'm not online, so the images are broken. But I would see the page here. And this tells me, like, oh, he's really interested in how much funding I've raised to date and what I'm going to use the next round of funding for. So I know before I even go on a call with this person, the level of interest, how quickly they were interested, how many partners they've shared it within the firm. For those partners, I can go and look up what other companies have they invested in that might be complementary to what I'm doing. And do they care about the product, the team, the solution, the finances? Um, so all these, like, all these little things that mean when I jump on a follow-up call with an investor, I know where to take the meeting. I know where that meeting is going to go. It doesn't mean I close every meeting, but it's just the little things I can do to increase my chances of winning. Does that make sense? Critical non-essentials. The next one I want to talk about, and this is really important, is diversity. Uh, so we have a tendency to hire people like us. And we hire from our friends, and it's this self-fulfilling prophecy. And when I was in the karate club, that first tournament uh, I went to in Glasgow, uh, I was like, how are, we gonna do, how are we gonna win this next year? And I looked around and there's a couple of things I noticed. So the men's heavyweight team, so there's, there's two disciplines, there's kumite, fighting, and there's kata forms. Um, there's male and female categories, and there's weights, you know, so lightweight, middleweight, heavyweight. And everyone, like, and it's wrong, but everyone's like, it's the men's heavyweight tournament. That's, that's what every club trains for, that's the, that's the event that's held at the end of the day, that's the one everyone gets around the mat for, there's no other events on at the same time. I'm like, well, we might not win that one, but then I looked at some of the other events that were underrepresented, and I noticed that, like, there's no junior women. There's just no junior women. Clubs aren't attracting women into the club because they're advertising at Freshers Week for, you know, their images on their posters are guys with feet in their bases as a roundhouse kick is landed on the head. You know, that's, that's, that's not your target market. Like, I didn't get a lot of women come to the club with that kind of imagery. So what we started doing in Freshers Week is we started running self-defense classes. We started doing things that would draw in the demographics that we wanted to draw into the club. And we nurtured our juniors. We really focused on a junior program that would trade. So when we went to that first tournament, we dominated the, 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 the women's, the women's uh, lightweight category. Um, sorry, the women's heavyweight category, you could almost guarantee three fighters would show up for the whole event. They were guaranteed before they even tied the belt around their waist that one of them was bronze, one of them was silver, and one of them was gold. And then Edinburgh showed up, and we were the bronze and the silver and the gold. So my point, you know, I really learned this in the karate club that you know, it, diversity is how you win. Um, but it's not only how you win, it, it, it has to start at the very beginning. You have to change the way you think about who are the people I want to bring into the team, into the company, and how am I going to build a company that is a place that they want to be. And the second thing I would share is, like, diversity means business. Uh, I'm actually on the board of a, of a uh, not-for-profit called Women in Sports Technology. We're trying to encourage more women into sports technology. Actually, for any of the women here, um, I don't even know the domain name. It's like not known my own surname. I don't know the domain But look for women in sports tech. Um, and uh, we're running fellowships every year. We've just completed fellowships for this year, but we're giving away fellowships to um, help women get jobs inside of sports technology companies to try and drive more participation in STEM. And what we're telling sponsors, the people that are paying for those fellowships, is it's, it's literally shown that having a more diverse team, having women on a team, uh, in fact, let me show this. Women founders are generally, so are statistically more successful than male founders, and older founders are statistically more successful than younger founders. I'm going to stand at the front and say that, I'm in my 40s. Uh, but statistically, the age of being more successful in starting and exiting a company is 42. You would have thought that like some industry experience might count for something. 
and I'll come to that. I'll come to that towards the end. But I would really encourage you to think about diversity not just as the right thing to do morally, uh, but it's the right thing to do for business. Have a really diverse team, and you'll make better decisions, and you'll build better product. Again, my, my team are rolling their eyes. It's not the biggest that eats the smallest, it's the fastest that eats the slowest. I love this video, by the way. This is Bruce Lee's original Hollywood screen test, where he's just terrifying some guy with the casting couch behind him. So it's not the biggest that eats the smallest, it's the fastest that eats the slowest. I actually stole this phrase from business and applied it to my karate club, and now here I am going in the other direction. And it really talks about, you know, when you're a startup, you have a lot of scarcity. You don't have, like, time, it feels like there's never enough time. There's definitely not enough money. Um, you know, your ability to walk into this, you know, the C-suite and meet with the CMO of Nike or the CMO of Adidas is nowhere near as easy as someone from Microsoft or someone from Adobe. Just having a, I'll never forget my first meeting with a Microsoft business card and I'm sitting in a room, this is like my second day, with the CMO from Procter & Gamble, one of the largest companies in the world. I'm like, just because I have like Microsoft.com on my business card, I get that meeting as a startup. I would never have been able to get that meeting. There'd be like layers of gatekeepers at the company telling me why, you know, he's busy, you can't, you can't meet with them. So there's definitely advantages to being a big company, but there's advantages to being a small company, and those advantages are all about speed and agility. Now, what I'm not saying is be Mark Zuckerberg, move fast and break things. That's kind of hubris. Um, like my company doesn't move fast so we can break things and fix them later. Um, you know, again, it makes for a great hero's journey, uh, but it's not re really uh, great progress. Speed is something I want you to think about a little differently. Let me give you an example. More martial arts terminology here, sensei no sen, to know before your opponent what they're going to do, essentially. So there's, there's two ways you think about, uh, um, that there's a go no sen, to, to attack from a state of waiting. That means I'm just gonna stand here, and I'm gonna wait, and you're gonna throw a punch, and I'm gonna block it, and then I'm gonna counter. Really risky, really hard. Sensei no sen is this idea that before you even flinch, I know what you're gonna do, and I'm gonna you know, deal with the attack before you even throw the attack. It sounds a little bit mystical and supernatural, right? But when we teach this as a concept, I don't really have time to explain who this um, awesome little judo, uh, judoka is in the background, but um, the idea of sen sen no sen is actually to create openings. It's, it's, uh, there's a great, if, you, if anybody read any neurolinguistic programming, NLP, there's a great concept of pacing and leading. That if you think of pacing and leading as like if we were to walk out the building together, I would walk totally in lockstep with you, and then slowly without you realizing, I could walk a little bit faster and start to veer off to the left, and you'll not even realize you're coming with me. I've paced you, I've matched you, and now I can start to take you in the direction I want to go. And that's a concept that uh, we think a lot about in coaching sport. It doesn't just apply to martial arts, it applies to, um, I mean, think about hockey, think about football, we're always thinking about how do I like, drop a shoulder so you think I'm going this way so I can create an opening in this direction. And how I, how I always think about applying this uh, to company building is really as I start shifting towards product and product marketing. So it's really hard as a small company launching a new product. I mean, you saw the product I'm trying to launch. You know, we've got a great video, we've got a great product. But we don't have Serena Williams or Tiger Woods as brand ambassadors. We don't have the budget of Nike. So we have to be a little bit more uh, clever. We have to use our startupness uh, to really think about how are we going to change this conversation. So something I would really encourage you to think about, what's the narrative that you want people to be using about your company or about your product? And rather than tell them that narrative, how do you make them discover it for themselves and then show up with the answer? So in selling, there's an idea called provocation-based selling. There's a great Harvard Business Review article from maybe eight or nine years ago. Um, it came from the downturn when we had the first downturn during the tech crash, and provocation-based selling was this idea of, you need to provoke people, you need to tell them a pain that exists. Uh, actually, the author of that article is Jeffrey Moore, who I spoke about earlier, and Jeffrey will talk about, you have to find a pragmatist in pain for whom you found a problem for which there are unavoidable consequences. In other words, find somebody who's like, I had no idea, but now I'm gonna get fired. What do I do about it? And then you show up with your, with, with your product or with your value proposition. So, so there's this idea of like, uh, so my first company, um, the, the, the one that I sold to Adobe, we were building rich internet applications. You guys have only ever known rich internet applications, but when we first had apps on the web, 
they were horrible experiences. Like just, you know, just I can't even think of an example, but you know, transacting online in e-commerce, you'd have to go through 15 pages with a 15 second load time between every page. It's like reading a book through a straw. It was just this horrible experience. So our, our provocation that we made to sell richer internet applications was that the internet is failing to deliver, deliver on its promise. It was this really dramatic statement. But then we'd show the statistics of users abandoning shopping carts, giving up halfway through a, a transactional process and going offline to your competitor. So that's sense sendo send. That's kind of creating an opening and then filling it with your product. I'll move on and talk about something else. I did, I did yeah. Have you seen the last samurai? I had to get an excuse to get this clip in here. So um, Tom Cruise has like, had a few beers. He's walking home in rural Tokyo. And all of a sudden, there's like three guys jump out with katanas, reaches into his pocket for his revolver, and oh, it's in New York. Uh, you know, a really terrible experience here. Typical. I think we've all experienced something like this before. But um, the point is, like multiple attackers. There's like multiple people. There's someone on every side, and they're more heavily armed than he is. And what's he going to do? And when you coach karate, um, I, every there's always a point where you know you go down to the pub after training, and then there's this like white belt or yellow belt who you know gets the confidence to ask the instructor, "Can I buy you a beer?" And you sit down, and all the instructors kind of look at each other. They're like, I, "I know what's coming. I know the question that's coming." Um, and you know they'll small talk, and then I'll be like, "Sensei." Um, how do you beat five people? You know, because now that I'm a yellow belt, like I've, I've, I've got one-on-one -on -one combat in the old, so I want to know how to beat five people at once. It's just always a, always a question you get asked. How do I deal with multiple attackers? And the answer is always the same. You know, Sensei, how do I beat five people? Hit the guy in front of you. And then what? Then hit the guy in front of you. And then what? You know the answer to this one now. Just hit the guy in front of you. And this is an expression. One of my co-founders is, is a martial artist as well. And I can tell you probably like at least once a month, and actually today, um, and he didn't know I was doing this talk, but actually today, like we literally use this expression with each other all the time, and we use it because there's moments in the life of a startup on a regular basis where suddenly things are overwhelming. You're like, oh my goodness, it's like this is happening, and this is happening, and this opportunity has dropped in, and they want us to be in New York in June, and do we have budget for that? And now at me, what are we going to do? And we're stressing out about how we're going to allocate our time when the answer is always the same. Hit the guy in front of you. Just what's the next most important thing? Deal with that. The other attackers, the other problems, they'll be there. They'll, they'll, surf it. They'll, they'll be right there as soon as you deal with the first one. But it comes back to this idea of as a startup, your agility comes from controlling your energy and your time. So this idea of like hit the person in front of you is don't allow your time to be smeared across the seven or eight like whack-a-moles that are popping up. What's the next most important thing? And really focus on it. And I know that sounds like a, a really simple time management trick and like did we really need this guy to come and tell us that. But this is the difference between winning and losing in startups. Like you've raised a tiny little bit of money, there's competitors breathing down your neck, you've been at a conference and shown everyone what you're doing and now Nike are thinking about it or Microsoft are thinking about it. You've got to be really ruthless with your time and just focus on things one at a time. Similarly, uh, a great expression, this is uh, the martial art of Aikido, and in Aikido this expression surfaces a lot, uh, turn when pushed and enter when pulled. And it's a, again, it's a, it's a concept that's about where are you going to put your energy at any one moment in time. I don't mean that in an easy term. Um, so turn when pushed, if someone really comes at you and is pushing you, you just want to turn your body to the side, let them go past you, and then engage. But if somebody's coming charging at you, I mean, you better be a linebacker if you're going to like dig in and try and stop them and have that head-on collision. Um, and, and when I think about that, I think about conflict. What I'm really talking about here is when you're running a company, there are so many opportunities for conflict. One of the biggest reasons startups fail, and I've been lucky that this has never been the case, nor will it be, um, just given the, the founders I've chosen, but one of the biggest reasons a startup will fail is the co-founders that you choose to start that company with. And frictions will appear between the co-founders. And look at Facebook, look at Snapchat, there's plenty of like, you know, multi-million dollars examples uh, of picking the, ro the wrong co-founder and the consequence of that. So whether that conflict is coming from inside of your company, whether it's a partner relationship, whether it's a competitor, I really urge you, Decide when you write the biography of your successful IPO, will this story even merit a paragraph and a chapter? Or can you just let it go? It's really easy to get drawn into picking fights with, you know, I, I don't 
we're recording. I'm not going to say it on my face uh, here. But it's really easy to get drawn into conflict with a partner or with a competitor um, or with a member of staff, with an investor. Just don't. Just turn, <coughs> let it go past you. You don't have time for it. But enter when pulled is different. And the idea of enter when pulled is, in a, in, a, in, a, in a martial arts saying, somebody grabs a hold of you and pulls you or grabs your wrist, what they're expecting is, and if you all sit there and imagine right now somebody's grabbing your lapels and boom, you're really tight, your reaction is this. Your reaction is your shoulders go back. The right thing to do is to just go with it. They're not expecting that, is to close that distance because the way you get speed is to move over distance in a shorter amount of time. So allowing yourself to be pulled in creates opportunity where the opportunity wasn't going to be. And you know, again, I, you know, I talk about this a lot with my teams, and it's the, it's the concept of serendipity. We love to think of serendipity as just these, like, who knew, how did that happen? But being open to when you get an invitation, when something pops up, when you get pulled a little bit um, in one direction, go with it a little. Don't necessarily commit fully, but go with it a little. And I want to share a couple of examples with you. At my first company, um, I got a you know, I was doing some work with Macromedia, a uh, company you guys may or not, they, they invented Flash, which became Adobe. Uh, but you know, the, the guy that was running consulting for Macromedia lived in Toronto, dropped me an email, he was like, hey Stephen, I'm going to be in London. And I live in Edinburgh, that's like 500 miles away in an expensive flight and an expensive hotel for a like, seven or eight person startup at the time. And I'd be in London, like if you're in town, I'm staying at the, uh, the hotel on Hyde Park Corner, if you want to go have a coffee. Uh, be great to see you. And I just turned to my business partner and was like, what, why is he emailing us? Like, why, why is he in Richmond emailing us right now? I think we should go. And my business partner, who's more Scottish than me, didn't want to spend any money whatsoever. But I, I talked Ali into it. I said, I think we should go. And about 20 minutes into that conversation, Ian had heard enough. And he said, uh, we're being bought by Adobe and we'd like to buy your company and you guys can be the star of Adobe Consulting. You can pick me up from the floor. And to this day, I still wonder, what if I hadn't taken that meeting in London? Like, I mean, it, it was that meeting that influenced his decision of like, ah, we should just have these guys come and work for us. They should just be, well, you know, we'll acquire hard one, basically. So uh, that, that meeting would have never happened unless we'd allowed ourselves uh, to be pulled in a little bit. The second story I'll tell is uh, we'd lost a ton of money for us at the time, probably about 100 grand of unpaid bills from a client who really tried to screw us. Ah, I hope you're watching this, Russell. But uh, I got a client who really tried to screw us uh, and, and, and cheat us out of paying bills. And it really hurt us. I mean, by this point, we'd moved into offices. We had staff. We had salaries. We had bills to pay. And 100 grand just disappeared. And then another client went bankrupt and couldn't pay us either. Through no malice of their own, he just went bankrupt. And I get a call. And, I want to say it's from Baltimore, and some guys like, hey, I've seen your work online, and I love what you guys are doing, and like, you know, we're gonna like, we're gonna be the best e-commerce site on the web, and you know, we'd love to talk to you guys about building it, but you'll need to come out, and you'll need to pitch for the work, and you need to show us what you can do, and I, I agreed with my partner Ali this time. I was like, this is just far too risky. Like, what are we doing, Baltimore? I don't even know where Baltimore is, and that's how I turned down the opportunity to build UnderArmor.com. So, you know, I wish I'd gone with that one. So, uh, <laughs> turn when pushed and answer when pulled. And I know you guys love your Under Armour around here now as well. <laughs> so, and just to finish, I should have said at the beginning, if you've got any questions, ask them now, because I'll run over time. And so, if you've got any questions, uh, jump them in. But I, I just want to finish with this one idea. Um, and I think it's important for this group here. Shuhari is a concept of learning in Japanese. Um, and it, it describes three stages of learning. And shu is the concept of, uh, here it says obey, but it's to learn from tradition. And if I was teaching you karate, day one, it's going to be stand here, your fear shoulder width, drop your hips, your hand goes here, I want your thumb up, I don't want it turned down. I'll be very like, this is the way it's taught right now. Just do it the way it's been learned. And there's many other skills, whether you've learned to play a piano or a violin or whatever. There's many skills where you're taught to do it the same as everybody else. And that's the stage of shu. That's learning from the tradition. And it's important. It's grounding. It's your fundamentals. It's what you always go back to. But then there's a moment where you start to break away from tradition a little bit or detach. That's ha. 
Um, the, the analogy I like to use here is a decent golfer, you know, someone that's you know, got a pretty good handicap and sure they went to the PGA golf instructor and they all learned, you know, exactly the same way to set up and they've all got the same swing. But then at some point you're like, you know, I don't have good retention in my T-spine and I can't really get my swing all the way here, so I'm just going to do a three-quarter swing. But I'm gonna. I find I can compensate that if I do this. And so suddenly, like, I get what the fundamentals are, but they don't totally work for me. And but this is what worked for me. And that's you in this like period of detachment. You've started to under. You've started to like attach the the learning to your body or attach the learning to your mind. And finally, there's transcendence. There's this idea that like, okay, I've totally got this. I totally understand this art, this craft, this sport. It's mastery. And that's where you start to break away from tradition. And startups tend to be in this phase over here. You see a problem that no one else is see because, sees because you, you're looking at it from a vantage point that others haven't looked at it, or you're bringing an experience that hasn't been brought to that problem before. But the thing I would encourage you to think about is you can't necessarily always jump in there. And I know most of you put your hands up when I said, who wants to be in a startup? Uh, who wants to run a startup? And it's very West Coast. It's very zeitgeist. It's very of the time right now. But don't, don't undermine how important it is that if you really care about something, go and spend some time in the problem. Like if you want to disrupt healthcare, I'll pick that as an example, maybe go and work for Big Pharma for a few years. Let them pay you. Learn a bunch of other transferable skills because you've never hired someone, you've never fired someone, you've never had a performance management conversation. You don't really understand necessarily the nuance of what it means to be in a quarterly driven business where you have to have a three year strategy, but you also have to deliver numbers every quarter. You don't know the nuances of a clinical trial process because you've never taken a drug through a clinical trial before. That's just one example. But if you really aspire to start a company, like I said earlier, the most successful companies are started by people in their 40s. That doesn't mean wait till you're 40, because it's harder when you're 40 and you've got a wife and kids in the house, and you know, there's many reasons why it's easier to start a company when you're, when you're younger. But please don't dismiss tradition. Please don't dismiss the idea that maybe I'll spend some time, uh, some time learning. So I'm going to finish there. Nana Kurobe Yaoki, fall seven times, get up eight. And I know the topic tonight was talk about failure and talk about struggle. But what I really wanted to share with you is you've all got experiences you can draw from. And so many of you put your hands up and you've played in teams and you've played sport. And I know here many of you will play sport at a good level. You'll have studied under great coaches and been part of great teams. Bring that experience to bear. It is transferable to starting a company. And I'm a, I'm a huge believer uh, that the playing field, uh, the dojo, the strength and conditioning room, uh, the, 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 the boat house, those are places where you'll learn really critical skills for starting a business um, on top of just having the passion uh, and the experience to do it. And uh, you'll feel like an imposter. It's going to be hard. Uh, but you know, if, if this is what you're cut out to do, it's one of the most rewarding things you're going to do. Good luck, and I can't wait to see the companies that you guys build. So I think that gives us 45 seconds for questions. <laughs> one or two questions. Is this helpful? And then if you don't, if, if you don't have to rush out, I'm sure I don't have to like rush. To, don't have to ask a question themselves after. But anyone have right now?